Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Energy and Utilities, How Procurement is Navigating the Forces of Change, presented by GEP, where insight drives innovation. I'd like to bring your attention to our webinar console. You'll notice on your main page or console, we've got a few windows for you to toggle around through. From speaker bios to the resource list to the slides and Q&A, you can move these around and maximize or minimize them to fit whatever screen or device you're using to connect. One important feature is going to be that Q&A box on your screen. We plan to save 10 minutes or so at the end of today's discussion for a Q&A session. So at any point, feel free to submit questions using that portal. The resource list gives you a link to a GEP white paper that also covers the topic of significant change impacting procurement in the energy and utility sector. So feel free to click on that link and download the complimentary white paper on our website, GEP.com. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It has a yellow question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. I'd now like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. We're joined by two of GEP's leading energy and utility specialists, Stephen Bucalo, Vice President of Consulting, and Jason Alukian, Director of Consulting Services. Between the two of them, they have several decades worth of experience advising global clients regarding strategic direction and best practices in sourcing and procurement. So without further ado, let's get this webinar started. Steve and Jason, off to you. Uh, thank you, Edie, and uh, good day. This is Steve Bucalo, and as Edie mentioned, I'm Vice President, Head of the Energy and Utilities Group, and I have over 30 years of consulting experience serving energy and utility companies worldwide. My specialization is in strategic sourcing. Jason? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Edie. My name is Jason Lukey, and I'm a director in energy utility practice at GEP. I'm just shy of 15 years of experience um, working in the energy and utility space. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, and I've worked with 25 of the top utilities in North America, um, as well as Africa and South, South, South America. Um, my expertise is it mainly lies in the direct categories and transmission distribution, both on the electric and gas side, generation, all types of nu nuclear, gas, renewable, coal, and uh, capital projects. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking with everyone today and um, talk to you all soon. Thank you, Jason. Let me move briefly to a um, slide which shows who GEP is. And uh, uh, GEP was formed in 1999 uh, and uh, is a recognized global leader in procurement and supply chain solutions. We have 14 offices and delivery centers around the globe, and we serve more than 20 industries. Energy and utilities is one of the leading industries within our, within our portfolio. Uh, we have more than 200 great clients that we serve. And uh, that includes some of the largest utilities and oil and gas companies in the world. And we manage over $75 billion of spend annually. Our offerings uh, go from strategy to managed services and technology. Uh, we provide end-to-end -end solutions and a unified source-to-pay platform that is referred in the marketplace as Smart by GEP. Let me now uh, begin with today's agenda. This webinar will discuss the changing political and regulatory environment and the resetting of global energy markets and the resultant implications to procurement. We will also do a deep dive into three segments of the energy business, and that includes nuclear power, which represents about 11% of the global electricity production, and the two leading sub-segments of renewable energy, that being solar and wind. Uh, on the overview slide, the goal of the webinar is to provide insight to procurement managers looking to navigate their procurement function and continue to deliver value in the time of significant energy growth. We will specifically discuss current issues and trends and their implications to procurement. Um, we will also discuss the types of procurement skills, talents, and tools required to meet these challenges. 
the introduction, please. The new presidential administration in the United States has put energy policy squarely in the spotlight as a central ingredient of its growth strategy. As the executive branch proceeds, which large-scale rollback of the Obama-era climate actions, procurement professionals within the energy and utility sector are trying to interpret the impact of these changes on the strategies and processes they employ on a day-to-day basis. The reduction uh, in utility regulations, including the withdrawal of the Clean Power Act, has been a significant change um, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the recent months. The pro-business stance on coal and mining, despite continued decrease in coal usage for electric production, is a possible area of optimism uh, for, that, uh, for that subsector. Recently, Secretary Perry, the U.S. Secretary of Energy, advocated for nuclear power, but we will talk in the next few minutes about the growth of uh, nuclear energy, and that will mostly come outside of the United States. And in the U.S. and around the world, there is broad support for renewables, specifically wind and solar. In continuing on the introduction, the Trump administration from the start has made regulation reduction and simplification of regulation a central part of its growth agenda. In March 2017, the president ordered the EPA to withdraw the Clean Power Rule, which was part of the climate initiative issued by President Obama in 2015. This rule imposed the first ever federal limits on carbon emissions from power plants, and this was done without congressional vote. The most startling events of 2016 for most business professionals were were the British vote to leave the European Union in June of that year and the election of President Trump in November. Central to both campaigns is a simple principle. The nation state takes priority over globalism. As the Wall Street Journal has noted, the new nationalist surge has startled establishment parties that never viewed globalism as an ideology. But it is, and its challenge will be shaping trade and sourcing decisions for the near future. On the right side of the geopolitical and market complexity shown on this slide are some of the items that also are a resultant of and influence of uh, of these policies. The potential of border adjustment taxes, although not probable. The rebuilding of the U- U.S. manufacturing base. The with- withdrawal of certain trade packs. And lowering of the U.S. corporate taxes as proposed in, uh, in the current rules. All of these together, plus the pro-business and nation-state priorities, have put significant challenges to global partnerships, and as a result, challenges to sourcing decisions. On the next slide, we talk specifically about this. Procurement professionals, in our opinion, need to be aware of these issues as they source for products in both global and domestic markets. It is imperative for procurement leaders to conduct a comprehensive review of supplier relationships and assess the potential risks associated with geopolitical shifts. Political teams should develop supply market strategies that recognize the potential implications in terms of financial costs, public opinion, and continuity of supply. The critical nature of this process should become evident to U.S. procurement leaders specifically as one considers that seven of the top ten solar panel manufacturers are located in China, and three of the top four wind turbine manufacturers are located in Europe and Asia. And Jason will discuss more of that in the coming slides. We believe that the characteristics of the progressive 
procurement organizations is that they should be informed of these issues. They should be supply market experts because of the changing geopolitical uh, environment. They have to be change management leaders. And of course, as has been the case for the last 20 years, they have to be technology savvy, informed, supply market expert, change market leaders, and technology savvy. All important to understand the implications of political and geopolitical strategies in both global and domestic markets. Let's now move to the energy markets. The abundant natural gas supplies in the United States are producing a global glut of this commodity, keeping prices at decade low levels. This is a result, as you know, of applying hydraulic fracking technology to gas trapped within shale formations. In addition, growth of infrastructure, such as marine terminals and pipelines, continues to support the export of natural gas from the United States to world markets, seen by many as the biggest shift in supply market dynamics across the globe. This trajectory will make the U.S. a net exporter of natural gas by 2018 for the first time in nearly 60 years. On the oil side, oil and the coalition of other nations continue to curtail oil production in hopes of rising the price of oil, which has been hovering for some time now, around $50 a barrel. About 2% of the world crude oil supply has been withheld in the event to bring supply back in line with demand. But a wall of crude oil storage is making the, glut, the global glut immune to curbs. As of early summer of this year, the price of oil was down about 17%. Another very important event that is occurring in 2018, and actually the president had made note of this in his trip uh, to Asia, which he's currently on, that Saudi Arabia anticipates next year its IPO of 5% of the state-owned Saudi Aramco. Um, the big issue is where, which exchange, uh, European or American exchange, will this IPO be let? U.S. oil output is now on pace to exceed nearly 10 million barrels a day in 2018, growing at an annual rate of 8% and are driven by American shale oil. The next slide takes a brief moment to talk about the overview of energy markets, including nuclear, solar, and wind power. Now, nuclear power generation accounts for about 11% of the global electricity production. There is currently between 440 and 450 operating reactors around the world. 99 are in the United States. In fact, the United States had its renaissance of building nuclear plants in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but we will talk more about the current state of that. There are 60 new reactors in construction around the globe. China has 20 of it, the largest single amount from any country. China, in the, and this is fairly startling news for someone who has been in the nuclear industry in the U.S., uh, for, uh, for, for my entire career, China expects to surpass the United States as the global leader in nuclear power by about 2026. And we will talk later that they have 36 reactors currently operating, about 20 more in construction, and more than 50 others planned. Moving to wind and solar, the, the wind and solar technologies continue to drive capital and operating costs down. As, as a result, the importance of certain tax credits and other incentives have diminished. Jason will discuss this in more detail. In addition, we're seeing the large energy players, primarily utilities and major oil companies, specifically Shell 
and others, investing heavily in wind and solar. And importantly for the oil companies, they're leveraging their expertise to build and operate large-scale renewable facilities in major offshore wind farms, um, wind farms, excuse me. Nuclear power in America. Nuclear power construction, as I mentioned earlier, began in the 1960s. At that time, over 100 reactors were built. In fact, there was hard to believe, but many lawsuits back then about utilities wanting to get into the nuclear reactor business because it was believed that it would become so, pro, pro, so efficient that electricity would, be, uh, uh, would, would hardly be metered. But since that, the renaissance in the 1960s and 70s, the last two plants that were built was the Watts Bar plant. It began in 1973, but it took till 1990 for it to actually become commercially operable. And the River Bend plant, which began in 1977 and became operational in 1986. So while over 100 plants and reactors were built in the 60s and 70s, these last two just mentioned became operational in the mid-80s and the early 90s. In early of the uh, Obama administration, in 2010, the administration gave approval for new nuclear plant construction through the Loan Guarantee Program. It was a great wind at the back for, for the nuclear industry and a lot of hope that the renaissance would continue into the 21st century. Two twin reactor programs were subsequently started in the states of Georgia and South Carolina by Georgia Power Company and by SCANA. But in July of this year, South Carolina reactor construction project was abandoned and the Georgia Power Project continues now, despite chronic delays and huge cost overruns. It has been cited in numerous publications that Westinghouse Electric Company, a subsidiary of Toshiba, filed for bankruptcy in March of 2017, citing $9 billion in cost overruns at these projects. Despite the advocacy recently of the U.S. Secretary of Energy Perry, it's doubtful that new U U.S. plants will become a reality beyond the two Georgia power plants pushing forward. Furthermore, in the United States, some utilities are clo closing nuclear plants as nuclear power faces stiff competition from cheaper sources of power, as well as continued political resistance from some parties. Most recently, Entergy announced the closing of its Indian Point plant as part of a settlement with the New York State. The state's governor has been a vocal critic of the plant. This brings the total number of plants scheduled to close by 2025 to four. But outside of the United States, nuclear has a very different view. As I, we mentioned earlier, nuclear power represents about 11% of the world's electricity, a very substantial share and that is through approximately 440 to 450 reactors. Now there is about 60 reactors currently under construction. As we mentioned, 20 in China, seven though in the US, five in India, and the remaining in other countries spread around the globe. It's important to look at the growth of nuclear power in China with their ambitions to lead the world in this energy form. Mainland China has 36 nuclear power reactors in operation, 20, as we mentioned, under construction, and over 50 planned. They are largely self-sufficient in reactor design and construction, but also draw on West technology from France, Canada, Russia, and yes, Westinghouse. The impetus for this massive build of nuclear power is coming from air pollution as a result of the burning of fossil fuels. It has been well documented 
that China's strength in this area, both engineering and operational, is also in its nuclear supply chain. Now, what does this all mean to procurement professionals? These construction projects are extremely large and complex and costly, as we've mentioned. The procurement and contract administration function of these projects is also complex and demanding. Procurement organizations, both on-site and in-home offices, are dealing with thousands of contractors covering major equipment, materials, parts, and services, typically over a five- to eight-year period. And, of course, as we've mentioned, there are outliers of that um, uh, where, where some of the uh, operational and construction have taken more than a decade. Procurement organizations serving these projects depend on integrated sourcing technology platforms to manage spend, to issue RFPs, and to contract with suppliers. Sound procurement policies, combined with rigorous sourcing methods, consistently applied throughout the project life, have paid huge dividends to these procurement organizations. As we read about the current companies involved in construction of these plants, we see that the construction is primarily built through large consortiums undertaking these massive projects. And in our opinion, is best served with dedicated independent procurement partners, team with owners and engineering and construction companies. This ensures efficient and effective sourcing for the most qualified and cost-effective suppliers around the globe. Specifically, it is our opinion that procurement organizations need to show the transparency of spend throughout the construction process of these large nuclear facilities. They need to maintain tight coordination between the owners, buyers, managers, and EPC personnel. And they need to have exceptional supplier and contract management technology, skills, and capabilities. Essential, in our opinion, are end-to-end -end procurement solutions that manage spend enable consistent and transparent bidding, develop contracts, and track and manage performance. Now, while there are about 60 reactors in construction, there are nearly 450 reactors in operation. So this requires a little different competency of procurement organization. We believe that procurement organizations which manage the maintenance and operation um, of these facilities have to have high competence in global market intelligence, including the performance and financial status of key strategic suppliers. They have to aid their engineering and operations organizations in retaining and securing suppliers, which can help maintain sound plant operations. And they must constantly seek best value sourcing. What is essential is ongoing supplier management programs, as well as support in negotiations and contracting to keep age plants in good economic standing. At this time, I'd like to hand over um, the uh, next sections to Jason. Jason? Thank you, Steve, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, Continuing on the solar section in terms of power generation, um, globally has, has experienced a lot of change and a lot of growth in the past several years. Um, as currently that there's no new or groundbreaking solar technology to be expected in those next several years, the, the new technology that is under development are ultra thin solar panels that are you know, thought to be able to be lined um, as a wallpaper thin solution that we put on the side of skyscrapers. This type of technology isn't in the process of being designed to replace large-scale utility generation, but this is uh, where the technology is headed. The majority of this technology innovation is happening within the United States, 
um, in terms of leading the way as well as some countries in Europe, such as Germany and France. Um, currently, the majority of manufacturers are increasing module efficiency in using advanced uh, manufacturing technologies to lower the cost of solar generation to make it more competitive, competitive with uh, natural gas uh, and wind. Um, the other key area in solar power is utilities are starting to utilize demand management and battery storage, um, mostly for the consumer side, less for the industrial customer or commercial side. Um, and uh, we have examples like Tesla and their battery storage pack as an example of um, you know the battery and demand management. When it comes to manufacturing, the the U.S. hate companies in the United States has has, uh, has ceased to exist. Um, there's only two or three major companies now manufacturing for solar, sun power, and Tesla. Um, but when we look across the globe, the top ten companies for manufacturing. Um, sit uh, in China, seven of the top ten. Uh, and this has to do with, uh, you know, market manipul manipulation by billions and billions of dollars by the Chinese government that are subsidizing manufacturing facilities help the Chinese manufacturing gain, weight, gain a foothold in, in the United States. And, and China has regularly been accused of dumping solar panels in the United States market um, and subsidizing their shipping costs as well. Uh, you know, three or four years ago, there was uh, several bankruptcies, a, a high note of Solyndra and Evergreen, um, where the Obama administration selected individual companies to back as opposed to backing the entire industry, um, similar to what China did. So this has led to a lot of uh, U.S. manufacturing rendering um, uncompetitive, and in the result, um, went bankrupt. Um, the Chinese market w w will dominate the manufacturing for the next several years, um, and this creates new risks and challenges. First off, the, the delivery logistics, you know, getting that from uh, overseas to the United States, an unfamiliar supply base with uh, no pre previous relationship. And this kind of coincides with Steve's um, earlier sentiments about supply relationship management and going beyond just that you know, strategic sourcing process. Cost transparency, understanding the, the entire cost components of each individual component of the of the solar uh, manufacturing process, and then of course product quality. How do you ensure product quality um, from something that's being developed, you know, and manufactured eight to ten thousand miles away from uh, its installation site? And then most notably, it's you know a huge component is cybersecurity. Um, typically, software is what runs the efficiency. Is um, being uh, kept safe from um, hackers. We talk about, well, how does this play into procurement play a role in aiding um, utility companies and the other business functions to help um, mitigate some of these risks? So the, the first component um, is expanding the procurement role. The majority of these projects, when we talk about large-scale utility uh, solar, typically um, utilities hire an EPC firm um, to you know, engineer, procure, and construct to, for these major projects. One increasingly component that we've found that procurement can play a role in is to leading, leading utility companies or giving control to the internal procurement organization or using external procurement partners to help to ensure timely and cost-effective delivery of the equipment and construct, site construction. Typically, that will remove the markup that EPC organizations put on the balance of the plant as well as on the uh, equipment, um, transformers, substations that are needed uh, to uh, manufacture the facility. The other area is the recognition of China as a, as a manufacturing powerhouse. Um, working with Chinese companies is, is the norm in many um, industries. When you look at Apple, you know, the majority of their manufacturing is done in China with their relationship with Foxconn. And um, granted, uh, that's slightly different in terms of the, the total scale that uh, Apple uses, but the, the strong ties developing, you know, maybe off-site locations in China and having remote employees that are based in China to oversee it to ensure that the um, products in terms of the quality uh, are adhered to that meet um, for the utility for large-scale pieces. So it's very important to take that SRM approach and working and building relationships with these Chinese suppliers. This takes both time and understanding from both parties. 
Um, here, here we also believe that the, the relationship has to be structured in, in a win-win scenario um, in terms of partnering with, with the Chinese manufacturers. So it's not that win-lose. So we develop objectives that attain both goals of the utility and the manufacturing companies. Um, the other uh, piece is when you're working with uh, overseas organizations, um, having a very rigorous RFP process. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the contracting piece. And then for Chinese manufacturing, have strict milestone-driven payment schedules that are linked to key phases of the construction project and for delivery, and most importantly, um, the go-live date, the operational component of when the electricity turns on, um, say, so, you know, J January 1st, that, um, that if it doesn't uh, do the expected power of, you know, 200 me megawatts, that the organization is held accountable for um, you know, defects in that technology. So th those are several ways that procurement can come add value to the business operation of solar. Um, going on to wind generation, um, you know, uh, this is a, a very innovative power that is kind of just hitting the United States. It's had a foothold in Europe for decades. Um, Europe leads and will continue to lead um, the, the globally, when it comes to wind generation, several countries are already, um, you know, 60, 70 percent. Granted, they don't have the infrastructure constraints that the United States has, and they tend to be a lot smaller and more homogeneous, such as the Netherlands, Denmark, um, and even countries such as France, Germany, um, where the you know, United States is more compared to kind of all of Europe. Um, so, of course, there's def definitely less ge geographical restrictions um, in Europe uh, compared to the United States. Um, at the end of 2015, there were about 3,000 um, wind, offshore wind terms and a total of 84 farms um, providing power to more than 7 million homes. And then as, as we look at that, there's several major projects um, currently taking place in the North Sea. Um, it's, it's important to call out here the kind of the change, and we call, this is the, the theme of this is the forces of change for this webinar, in that, you know, the standard players in um, – wind are starting not to be wind companies, but more oil and gas and say more traditional um, exploration production companies. You know, Dong Energy, which is the Danish state-owned company, is the biggest player in the wind market. Um, and they're currently building a large facility in the North Sea. And then we have other companies such as Royal Dutch Shell, um, you know, one of the, the, the top six super majors in the E&T e industry are now leveraging their ocean drilling experience um, to build in the North Sea to ensure that um, the, the new structures are compatible and safe in the harsh environments of the North Sea. Now, there are other major North, North uh, European players, Norway Statoil, another um, large um, E&P company, um, you know, is building um, three, has built three wind farms in the Baltic Sea, and they're developing the world's first floating offshore wind farm right now off the Scottish coast. France just announced um, about six months ago, that Total, um, another super major um, of the exploration production, is now um, going to become a, a utility and that their goal is to become a 100% um, electricity-driven uh, organization uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, so it, it's a big change in terms of how the wind industry is now being influenced by um, ex oil and gas companies that are really changing the way um, – that's right, that, that contracts are done. And these organizations are heavy, cash heavy, um, have a lot of experience of, of drilling and operating in remote re regions. So this, they're bringing that expertise to uh, the wind market, which is, you know, really only like 20 or 30 years old compared to the oil and gas industry that's going back, you know, 100, 150 years, depending on the region. Um, when we talk about the United States, there's always been – um, a, a huge resistance to um, offshore wind power. Cape Wind um, off the coast of Massachusetts has been tied up in legal battles for over a decade and just recently was um, essentially canceled. ...of getting these major large-scale offshore projects up and running. Recently, there's been some headway. The first offshore wind farm um, is on Block Island and I think operational in late 2017. And the, you know, the largest offshore wind farm to date is uh, was just being approved off Long Island Sound. Um, and to continue with the theme with Europe, we're beginning to see, you know, very large multinational developers, Statoil and Dong, investing in the U.S. wind business. 
um, and they're they're snapping up leases and ocean parcels to generate uh, and develop this land on their own. Of course, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, regulation does play a big component of this. Um, tax breaks and subsidies does help prop up the uh, the wind um, the wind uh, industry, but you know that that is one big risk. And a lot of these organizations are looking for the long play uh, in terms of you know making these projects sustainable on their own without government government subsidies. Um, in terms of wind turbines, uh, they're getting bigger and more efficient. Uh, there's a lot of healthy competition between Siemens, Joey, GE, Goldwyn, and Japanese uh, and Chinese manufacturers, and uh, they, they come, the, 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 the wind turbines are becoming larger and more efficient, which then, of course, um, creates more power for less size. Um, the key area in terms of you know where, where pure procurement can play a role um, in in the wind is, in, in the wind industry is uh, the operation in and maintenance. This is one key area that organizations tend to forget about. You know, usually the engineering group or the capital project group focuses on the capital cost of how to develop um, one of these facilities. Um, and once it gets up and running, they it, it get the operation and maintenance of spare parts, um, generator replacement belts, you know, oil and uh, oil lubricants, um, and ma uh, maintenance of the nacelle tend to be fall be fall behind. So similar to the gas revolution um, for gas turbines in the in the 80s and 90s, putting together long-term service agreements or LTSAs really helps um, drive down those costs. And then with wind with wind power, the uh, the OEM you know of course likes to have complete control over those spare parts and critical parts. So developing strong relationships and um, developing and negotiating those costs up front with the major uh, OEMs, Avestas, Siemens, GE, Mitsubishi, really helps um, reduce those costs in terms of spare parts, inventory management, maintenance schedules, um, uh, will drive efficiencies and save costs in those areas. Um, an another key piece is that when these developments are made, they're usually done in several different areas at once. Um, so cr creating... Um, Autonomy across the the portfolio of a utility will help drive down costs. Um, so th th these are other um, key areas of procurement can help um, drive value um, in the in the wind power space for operation and maintenance. Edie, uh, we'll so, uh, turn it back yeah. over to you. Okay, thank Excuse you both, me, uh, Steve and Jason. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, from the audience, um, which uh, I think we certainly have enough time to, to cover these questions in our, the Q&A portion of our session today. So I do have a question that I think uh, uh, is pertinent to Steve's area of expertise because it pertains to uh, the nuclear sector of the energy and utilities industry. So the question is, given the problems with some major nuclear suppliers, what should procurement groups do to manage supplier risks? Okay, uh, good question. Um, procurement organizations should always be working closely with their internal engineering and operations partners to maximize value and, 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 and reduce risk of these existing suppliers. Specifically, though, together with engineering and operations, Procurement should lead a proactive supplier management program, including scorecards to be maintained for key suppliers. Typically, we see for the key 20 or so suppliers that this is done on a quarterly basis. This ensures that expectations are being met across multiple parameters and risks are being minimized. One other thing that we would suggest is that the procurement teams really keep a keen eye on new market entrants and promote a healthy competition among suppliers to reduce no-bid contracts and provide alternate supply channels to the operations and maintenance teams. So those would be the things that I would focus mostly on, close coordination with the engineering and operation organizations a good proactive supplier management program, including scorecarding of key suppliers on a quarterly basis, 
and then to make sure that they have a keen eye on new market entrants, which will which will continue to have healthy competition uh, in in the operation and maintenance phase of the of the plant. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, we have another question, which I think. Uh, would be appropriate for Jason to answer because it uh, covers um, the wind and solar um, segment of, of the, the industry. So the question is, Jason, given that most of the wind turbine and solar panels are manufactured outside the U.S., what level of market research should be conducted on these categories? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, when, when first when you develop any uh, category strategy or go-to market approach for RFP, understanding the, the market and current components inside it are very key to what your strategy should be. Typically, we kind of break up our market intelligence into two key areas, primary research and secondary research. So the primary kind of breaks down into G, uh, you know, GEP's internal subject matter expertise in a, as well as our internal database um, of, of where we track and understand trends that are in um, the turbine industry. The second piece is secondary research, where it's like page, page subscriptions, journals and magazines, authentic government websites, and of course, um, you know, private industries um, like AWA that um, track these types of things. The next important piece is to fact check. Um, make sure that the, the data is valid um, and understanding that make sure we have facts and that we review assumptions for the for the future scenarios. Then of course, um, once we gather that data, it's, it's important to turn that into information. How do we interpret that data? How does that, how do those implications change our category strategy? How do they impact future decisions that need to be made two, three years out? Um, and how do we forecast that in, it, in ensuring that we call out any key areas and assumptions that we make? Um, so from that component, we, we take that and then we turn that into the, the market intelligence and then we intercede that with uh, our category strategy and then execute upon that. So going back to the original question, yes, I'm having very detailed market intelligence for a lot of these components that are manufactured outside the United States. Very, very key and important to have up to date and accurate uh, market intelligence to help design the optimized uh, sourcing strategy for the project. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Steve. Um, well, folks, we have come to the end of our allotted time for today's webinar. I want to take a moment to thank you all for attending, and uh, again, a very large thank you to Stephen and to Jason for facilitating today's discussion. If you submitted a Q&A question that we weren't able to cover in our allotted time, we'll be in touch shortly to continue on with the conversation in a more direct uh, basis. This presentation will soon be available for on-demand view, and you will all receive the information to view the on-demand recording at about this time tomorrow, so keep an eye out for that. You will also be able to access the webinar recording in the Knowledge Bank on the GEP website, www.gep.com. From GEP, we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>